Welcome to Pacific Mammal Researchers Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man podcast. I'm Cindy. I'm Kat. I'm Trevor. And this is uh, a new year and a new season, season three. We've been doing it for three seasons now. It's kind of crazy. Thank you for coming with, on this journey with us and hope you stay uh, for the rest of this year and beyond. Um, so we are starting the year off with a marine mammal highlight. And we didn't let you guys choose this time because, well, we figured you're busy with holidays as many of us were. Um, and we had the idea of doing the hourglass dolphin because it's an hourglass and we're turning new time in the new year. See, get it? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we're going to do the hourglass dolphin and it's a very beautiful dolphin and Trevor's going to tell us about that. Um, and there's also a lot we don't know <laughs> and we'll explain why we don't know it. It's a very good reason, um, but uh, just a caveat there. We're gonna have a little bit less to talk about than we have for other species. So I will let Trevor start us off. So I'll start with one example of why we don't know anything about them is because they're really hard to get to. Mm -hmm. um, they are only found in offshore waters in the Ar or Antarctica and sub-Antarctic waters. So where it's like the worst weather in the world essentially. Yeah, where like you don't want to be, even in good <laughs> um, weather, really. <laughs> no. So they got a circumpolar range, but it's basically just look at Antarctica, go off the shore, and go in a circle. That's their range. Um, so most sightings have been when people go around the southern tip of South America. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of people go elsewhere. So. Yeah, and the the Drake, I saw that Drake Passage is where they have the, the, the yeah. highest concentration, although is that because they're the most there or that's really wherever you know when everybody's around that area you, you go through the Drake Passage. <laughs> right. Yeah. So appearance wise there is a few measurements because we don't have a lot of specimens <laughs> but what I could find was males the largest they found was 5.9 feet at 200 pounds mm -hmm. and they said it said females likely grow bigger. Okay. I don't know where the evidence was for that. But. <laughs> <laughs> for the few that they have. And right. I know. I, uh, I think a, a lot of it, they, they, they relate to other Lagarynchus in the genus Lagarynchus. Right. So other ones that are similar, they're like, well, it's, they're probably like that one. But appearance wise, they're all black with a white belly and they have a long white stripe on the side that essentially looks like an hourglass, hence the name hourglass dolphin. So it's like thick on towards the eye and dorsal fin, goes to really thin under the dorsal fin, and then wide again towards the peduncle. They're mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful. Like They're we really will in pictures if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm sure we'll, we'll pop a picture in for you. But um, yes. yeah, they are gorgeous. They're, and they're in the so same, delicate. They're in the same genus as the dusky dolphin. Mm -hmm which looks very similar. If you just look at the genus, they all look very similar. Just so they, patterns, essentially. Yeah, and they, I know they said that it's fairly common for people to mistake the peel, Peels dolphin and Dusky dolphin for with the hourglass dolphin for that right. reason. Um, they're really easy to miss, or they're hard to misidentify in their geographical range because not a lot, the things that the dolphins that look like them, essentially, coloration-wise, are very different, as in, Orcas are much bigger, obviously. And the southern right whale dolphin doesn't have a dorsal fin. So it's hard to misidentify them. So once you see them, you need to kind of know what species it is. Right. <laughs> like it's got a fin. Okay. Right. <laughs> and dorsal fin wise, it's the females have like the classic hooked fin. Um, and the males tend to have more of a hook towards the back a little bit more. So it kind of curves more back in a way, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I always wonder with that with that kind of stuff and with the coloration, like obviously there were some kind of pressure to make the coloration these different one, you know, different for different species and stuff. And like, why? <laughs> What's the benefit? <laughs> it's very interesting to think about. And 
Uh, let's see, rostrum wise, they don't ha- it's not that pronounced. It's not like a bottlenose dolphin, but it's also not as blunt as a porpoise. So somewhere in between. But okay. again, picture is probably the best way. <laughs> yeah, I'll it. have one. Um, I'll have one up in, on the for the YouTube for the YouTube audience. <laughs> But yeah, that's kind of what we know about them because we haven't seen them a lot. And most of our information is from very few necropsies from those that have washed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute too for <laughs> the reason why we have that. Um, but I always, I always think just th- talking about the geographic range, I, I don't know much about it, but anytime I hear the Drake Passage, it, it it's always like, good God, why would you want to be out there? <laughs> like It's just so intense. And then when the weather's bad, there's just huge waves and it's very dangerous going out on that southern tip um so that's what i just was like well there that's really the main reason why we don't know about these guys (laughs) who wants to be out there as cool as it would be okay well so i will go ahead then and get in with the, the bit of information that we do know about uh the diet and behavior um, so again, as we're talking about, you know, the reason why we know very little is because of where they live. They like the deep water, right? So they're very pelagic species. Pelagic means basically deep water. Um, they like to live in waters that are between 31 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I saw one was like, uh, it was negative, negative 0.3 degrees Celsius. So below, below freezing, right? 31 degrees is right below freezing um, near the uh, what's called the Antarctic Convergence. So that area is where the sub Antar- the quote unquote warm sub Antarctic waters <laughs> meet the cold uh, Antarctic waters. Um, so of course, warm being relative, of course. Um, but that's really like where they like to hang out. Um, so they'll rare, they've rarely been sighted in some shallow water um, near the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and around some islands and, and, and like banks of, of land, uh, but not very common. Again, they really do like that deep water. Um, and there was one, which is most likely uh, some vagrant that decided to do a walkabout or something, um, was seen in the inland waters of Southern Chile in 2013. Wow, interesting. Yeah. So it was right down that Southern tip, but he went up into the inland waters, um, you know, kind of <laughs> like we have here in the Salish Sea. Um, yeah, we'll get so, the occasional ball on those here. Yeah, exactly. He's like, no, I just don't really like the, uh, the the weather right now, so I'm just gonna hop over to Chile and hang out for a minute. <laughs> uh, and he was with a couple of her, I think it was with the uh, duskies um, or or peels dolphins that they it was he was hanging out with there. So all same genus. Yeah, yeah there, there's always those weirdos that are just like, I'm just gonna wander and see what's about. Um, so, well, who knows? And who knows what will happen now more with climate change and things like that. This things could happen. And I'm sure Kat will talk a bit more about that later. Um, so they did say they're like, you know, they might complete north-south migrations, like a lot of uh, species do, will move um, from one area to another during the seasons. But basically they're like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they have been seen off the southern tip of New Zealand though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because I read several things where they were saying like, oh, they've been seen off New Zealand. That's pretty much like the only place where they've ever been seen like from land. <laughs> yeah, yeah so I think they were saying that the, the northern extent of that is is unknown, like how far north they go since we're in the southern hemisphere, like um, how basically where those warmer waters are, quote unquote. Right. Um, okay. So yeah, they, they don't know exactly where that limit is. Gotcha. Um, they are group size. They're found in... Um, normal kind of dolphin groups of between one to 12 individuals with the average of being about seven from the limited studies that they have, but they have been seen in groups of up to a hundred. So it's, I I find that a little interesting because most of the time when you talk about pelagic species, they are often in hundreds to thousands, right? Pacific white-sided dolphins, for example, other lags, um, they are seen in hundreds and hundreds of animals. So it's interesting that, especially out there in such crazy waters, they don't actually have larger group sizes. I thought that was interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so on to the life history information. It's not a lot, <laughs> no, so little. Um, We're just eating but- episode people. We're just like, you know, here's just a really brief thing to just get you back. <laughs> Hello. That's right. <laughs> it's easing back into the new year with yeah. some very basic information. Um, so we do, a lot of times life history data, uh, especially for 
species that are hard to study in the wild, you know, we can't follow them days on end. Um, we use uh, stranded in individuals, right? So again, like with porpoises, a lot of that life history, how old they are when they reproduce, we find from stranded individuals. But as Trevor mentioned before, um, they don't strand that often, likely because they're in the middle of the ocean and there's no place for them to strand, right? They're gonna sink or get eaten before they reach any type of land. So um, they're about five on record of ones that they've looked at. I think uh, that's why I've heard to mention too, we don't really, there's no confirmed coloration of the calves either because they oh, haven't yeah. seen a calf. Yeah, right. and I'll talk about that in just a second too. It's right. crazy. Yeah, yeah, no, it's that's perfect lead in. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the calves are very, very uh, rare. So they, they, they seem to be cited less often. In a study that looked at uh, 1,634 individuals, they saw three calves. Wow. Like that's bonkers. Um, so they did cite, they're like, well, this could be due to the birthing season not coinciding with the field work time. So if they're having their babies when people can't be out in that rough weather, that mm -hmm. could be. Um, it could also be that females actively avoid research vessels. There's reasons why this could be. Obviously they're having calves. <laughs> We just don't get to see them. Just asexual budding. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be amazing. Just a little dolphin just buds off the side. Here you go. It'd be so cute. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's why we don't have any coloration for them because for the calves, because we don't really get to see them. Who knows? Um, that would be a really fun thing to find out to be the first one to, to be able to document that. Why um, they, <laughs> I mean, we like black and white stripes, like a, um, like a referee Ref jersey or something. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then it like melds into the, the other one. That'd be funny. Um, so we don't, we have no idea how long they live again, because there's no strandings. We don't have, you know, no photo ID of these individuals to track over time. Um, but they basically think it's similar to either the Atlantic white sided, which is 27 years or the Pacific white sided, which is 46 years. So it, it's pretty long. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's probably around uh, other dolphin species, which is up to 50 years. It's pretty common. Um, let's see. So again, with reproduction, they literally know nothing. Like there's not even just like, we know this little bit. No, they know nothing about wow. it. Um, and all they basically said was that it's likely that it's similar to others in the Lagaranchius uh, genus. Um, they give birth about every two and a half years, gestation of about 12 to 13 months, and they nurse for about a year, year and a half. Um, so that's all just like, maybe they're like them. That's all we got. <laughs> and I don't, we don't even know what calves look like. <laughs> so one thing we do know about these guys is that their behavior, they, they're like other dolphin species. They love to bow ride. So they'll, on, on the larger ships, it's a uh, very common behavior for a lot of dolphin species. It's just fun. They get, they literally are catching a wave and just like surfing on the bows on the bow waves, um, not on the bows, or that would like on the boat, um, but. Hmm? Would not end well. No, yeah, it would not. Um, but the cool thing about these guys is they actually will bow ride on other large whales, which I think is so cool. So you don't think about these larger, the baleen whales moving that fast, but that big of an animal, even though it looks like they're slowly moving or, or creating a, a big bow through the water and they're moving pretty, quick in comparison. Um, so they can, act, dolphins can actually um, ride that. And there's a few other species that do that, but these guys are apparently well known for it. And uh, with that, they are very sociable with other species. So they've been sighted with fin whales, say whales, minke whales, our nose beaked whales, southern bottlenose whales, long finned pilot whales, orcas, southern right whale dolphins, and other also southern right whales. <laughs> so this, I, I always love that it's like, okay, they gave that dolphin name, Southern right whale dolphin. Like that's just not, that's not confusing at all. <laughs> yeah. But apparently these guys are, are quite sociable and um, like to hang out with other species. Um, they can swim up to 22 kilometers per hour or 13 and a half miles per hour. So pretty quick. I guess they've maybe, I don't know how they figured that out, but <laughs> they did. Probably tracking when they're, when they're finding them on vessels, I'm sure they're yeah. just like, how fast are they going? How fast is our ship going? Okay, cool. This exactly. guesstimated. Likely. They did some fancy math. <laughs> Figure that out. 
Um, so the last thing is diet. And so again, research on, on what an animal eats is often conducted on stomach contents. That's a very common way to do it because we don't get to see them catching the fish and swallowing them. Um, but again, we only have like five of those individuals. So the entire diet for the species is based on those few individuals that they have stomach contents for. Um, and they've identified fish, squid, and crustaceans. And that's the, that's the extent of, I mean, there was one paper that gave a few species, but it, it's, it, that's just one and a couple individuals. Right. Um, they, do, they do see them feeding in larger groups, um, which makes sense in that open pelagic waters. Uh, they will feed in when there's big plankton swarms, which makes sense because the plankton swarm, the small fish form, swarm, and then there's plenty of food for them to eat. Um, and this also attracts seabirds, which we've talked about in other podcasts that birds will come to steal the fish that the dolphins or seals or sea lions have um, put into a nice little area for, for everybody to snack on. And um, so that's one thing that does help is that when they do that, researchers can find them. So it's probably why we know a little bit more about that behavior than anything else. Sure. Um, and the last thing I have, which is real interesting, and this will link it kind of back to porpoises, um, is they, they do have some information from a passive acoustics recordings, I think passive acoustics, uh, that they've set out. Um, they've recorded some of these uh, animals, uh, and they have whistles and clicks, uh, but what we're talking about here is the echolocation clicks. Um, so like other dolphin species, they, uh, they, that's what they use to find food. Um, but interestingly, their clicks are narrow band with high frequency. So similar to what porpoises um, have. So it's a high frequency, which basically we can't hear uh, because it's too high pitch. Um, and the, what they, they had a little spectrogram of, of what the, um, the, the sound looked like and compared it to other species. And it is drastically different than other Langerhanchus genus uh, hmm. species, but it's almost identical to the Hector's dolphin, which is a Cephalorhanchus. Interesting. I'll, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So, uh, so that was really cool. I mean, it's it, it like if you look at the two, you're like, oh, that's the same, you know, same species, We're very very close. Um, and so they did talk about that and that. And we've talked about this a little bit, I think, on other podcasts where the taxonomy of species is really in flux, especially for certain ones where we're learning more about them and the genetics. Uh, and there has been some debate as to whether, you know, where the line should be between the lags and the cephalorhynchus. Um, and this, these vocalizations may f filter into figuring out where they should be, where these species and genus um, delineations should, should happen. Um, so, uh, the only last thing I have is that they, that, so they produce those sounds, but they produce it at a higher source level than Hector's dolphins. So they can detect prey at more than twice the distance compared to Hector's dolphins. And this yes. makes sense because they live in open ocean where it's very wide open to be able to, you know, find something. Whereas Hector's dolphins live within a mile or two of shore, like they're very mm -hmm. coastal. So they're not going to need to project as farther, as farther, as far. <laughs> um than than the uh the lags will so that's what we know about behavior and diet of this beautiful enigmatic species um and we're going to move into the the good and the bad at the end here the fun facts and the threats of whatever we know about those um in just a second after we take a quick break All right, we are back and Kat is going to lead us into the threats as we know them and some hopefully some fun facts if we left her any. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's first talk a little bit about their status, which will be very brief, as you can imagine, because uh, we don't really know anything about them. Um, so they do estimate that they're over 140,000 um, hourglass dolphins worldwide. I mean, obviously worldwide within their range. Right. This is based on the last population count, which from what I could find was one of the only population counts, which was done in like the late 80s. Um, oh, wow. And that, that count was 144,300 individuals. So there's that. So that information is likely about, you know, 
ish 30 years out of date probably um right. and we're, we're we're mad when it's like 10 years out of date yeah right and so as we already talked about i mean you can now understand why that would be especially because a lot of these counts are done either from the surface of a large vessel or aerial counts um neither of which would be particularly easy or fun in antarctic waters uh, <laughs> or the Drake Passage or any of those really, really gnarly seas. Um, so again, that's what it's based on given their, I'll get into the threats in just a second, given their relatively few known threats, they're not thought to necessarily have dropped a ton in the numbers mm -hmm. there, but obviously we don't really know. Um, and the IUCN status is listed as a species of least concern, I think because they don't have a ton of natural threats um, and they are very difficult to access. Um, I think so, that's, that's part of the thing that's saving them because yeah, they, their anthropogenic, anthropogenic threats are much more limited because nobody goes there. <laughs> right. And I'll get into that in just a second because they are, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will stay that way. Right. Of so course. again, before the threats, um, they have no direct threats except for predation by killer whales. So killer whales are basically their only known natural predator. Um, and again, like this, yeah, makes total sense. So that's, it was interesting when you were talking about the vocalizations, because if your only predator is a killer whale, and that's one of the theories that's been postulated for why harbor port, the high frequency calls is that their main predator is, is killer whales, that high frequency might actually evade a lot of the killer whale hearing range. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a potential thought as to why that could have um, evolved specifically for this species, if that's your only predator any sort of thing that you can have in your at your disposal that you can help to avoid those predators is going to help out. And also because um, group size goes a lot into predator avoidance. And so like Pacific white sided have you know huge groups, so that's protective. But if these guys are keeping smaller groups, then maybe this other thing happened to having that high frequency that helps them avoid detection. Exactly. Exactly. So very intriguing. Mm -hmm. um, the only real threat that is listed for these guys is of course climate change, because any sort of, we've talked about this in almost every other podcast, because every species living in the environment will be affected by climate change. Um, but the but ones in the poles more so. Right, obviously these Arctic and Antarctic species are gonna be the most quickly affected. Right. Um, so again, like I mentioned earlier, first of all, they might actually be under more stress from this already than we realize, we just simply can't see it because we're not able to observe them. Um, but as we've talked about before, any sort of like temperature shift in the, in the water is gonna result in prey shifts in potential changes to their migration patterns if they have them, which again has been postulated. Mm -hmm. um, potential increase in human activity. So we've talked about this before as well, where the more accessible areas get due to, you know, reduces, reductions in sea ice and all that kind of thing, that does change drastically how much we can actually access these areas. And as our resources dwindle, you know, we're pushing further and further into the poles to access materials as well. So currently they're fairly isolated, whether it stays that way or not remains to be seen. Well, and for example, I mean, there's cruise ships that go to the Antarctic now. My friends were going to go on one before, before COVID ruined the last two years. Um, yeah, but they, well, I mean, they, if you look because of these guys online, a lot of them are from whale watch ships and, yeah. and not in the area, which granted obviously have a fairly short period of time that they can go out, but regardless, it, it's already happening. Right. Um, so again, not to dwell on that for too long, but it, it is something that, you know, these guys will be more impacted by that simply because of where they live. Right. Okay. Fun facts. Let's wrap this Yay. up here. This, um, is short, this is the shortest threat section on any of the animals that we have. <laughs> Especially after some of the previous ones we just did too, the last few marine mammal highlights have been very, very extensive for the threat section. So this right. is kind of refreshing. To be like, hey, they're fairly yeah. safe and they're nice little okay. bubble. Down. <laughs> for now. Nice little gnarly hundred foot seas. Right. Um, so yeah, as we already mentioned, they are the only dolphin with a dorsal fin living below the Antarctic convergence zone. So that's kind of exciting. Um, and their Latin name, um, which I, this is super cool. So their Latin name is Lagenorhynchus cruciger. So the Lagenorhynchus comes from the Latin lagenos, which means bottle, and rhynchus means beak or snout. So right, because ry rhino, rhino is nose. Yeah. Right. And then cruciger actually means cross carrier. 
And that refers to the area of black coloration, which again, does kind of form a cross on the body with the white in between. Mm. Um, so and that- we were talking like a, a, an X or a, or a cross. Cause I would see it, I would see it as an, as an X, which you can also say it's cross. Well, it's an X, but it vaguely resembles a Maltese cross or cross pate. So oh, it's a specific okay. that it's referencing. Um, that makes sense. And that's where that, that name came from. So their Latin name and their common name refers to their very obvious coloration, which is pretty cool. Right. Um, and the, let's see. We already talked about the surface temperatures a little bit. The warmest recorded, you know, just to put in context how cold water they're living in, right. the warmest recorded, sur- recorded surface temperature was uh, 30, 13.4 degrees Celsius, which is about 56 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the right. warmest surface temperature that these guys have ever been observed in. <laughs> That's cold. <It's>, yeah. <laughs> which is like, no, I like it right about freezing. Thank you so much. Right. <laughs> Um, and just to end, cause again, you know, we don't know a lot about these guys, so there really isn't too much to share here, but just to end, I thought it'd be kind of fun to explore a little bit about where we first discovered these guys. Cause obviously they live in this really, really difficult to get to area. Like who the heck saw these in the first yeah, place? Who was the first one to be like, Ooh, let's go out there. So apparently they were discovered about 200 years ago and they were the only cetacean or they are i believe still the only cetacean to have ever been classified based only on eyewitness accounts oh there's no pictures or anything like pictures that pictures attached to it there were no just like just sailors came back and they were like we saw these things oh. um, so this is a quote um, from a website that i found so it was declared a new species by french naval surgeons and naturalist jean rené constant key i I, mean, I don't speak french i apologize <laughs> And Joseph Paul Guimard using nothing but a sketch made as they ran an expedition in the Antarctic in 1824. So they drew a sketch. They saw these animals, they drew a sketch of them. Obviously where they were their markings, you're unlikely to mistake another dolphin in that area for this one. I mean, basically the only thing you'd be mixing it up with probably even in 1824 is a killer whale. Right, and that's what, that's what they said that some, they will, could get mistaken for that, but the size difference is, enormous right, so right. these guys are like 200 250 pounds like, as opposed to a couple tons or more yeah. orcas so yeah so that was what basically was used to identify this as a new species is they're like well nothing else existed like that that we've ever seen this must be a new species and it's so distinctive that basically it was given that level of classification of like well if we ever saw one of these we'd know what it is so it's got right. to be a new one well, and that's interesting because, you know, the, oh, it's the Antarctic, the Antarctic orca ecotype, it's the D, is it D, it's D, right? So that one's similar in that way, in that we know that they exist, but mainly from sailors that are out there. And they're like, mm-hmm. but they only recently opened, it was like last year or the year before that they finally legitimately documented and got samples from, um, tissue samples from the Antarctic type D uh, uh, orcas. So it, like it, to- it makes total sense, but it's still kind of crazy that they, that someone would, you know, you're like, well, that's a species, but that's a, we got the sketch and that's it. But like, that's what you got to work with out there. <laughs> yeah. And in 1824, I mean, that was, you know, they were probably one of the only people that were able to get down there and not yeah. die. Right. Well, and yeah. then also like, they're fairly quick. They're, you know, the, they're going through the water and the barrel riding. I guess if they're barrel riding, you might actually have a bit more time to, to look at them. But I'm right. thinking of like a doll's porpoise where it's just like... <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, how, do you, yeah. how do you get enough to stretch that down but they probably do bow ride more so that would be a bit easier yeah to do but, yeah but it's, sketching dolphins is not easy i i used to do it in the bahamas when we would do id work there and let me just tell you my dolphins oftentimes look like pigs so <laughs> good on them for creating a sketch that is actually like a dolphin and could you could name a species from right and then again, like as people started to filter in with eyewitness accounts and more eyewitness accounts and eventually photographs, like to be right. able to have still identify it based off of that original sketch is pretty phenomenal. That's pretty impressive. Very impressive. And I thought that was a pretty cool little story. So that is very cool. That's, that's an awesome story. I was not prepared for that. I was like, you know, there's these other different fun, fun facts. I'm like, ooh, history. I like it. <laughs> oh, and that's all very I got. Cool. All right. Well, we uh, managed to pack in quite a bit of information on a species that we have very little information on. <laughs> but with, what I liked about this too, though, is that we, you know, we talked about many of the species that we know a lot about, but with this one, you know, we, we know what they look like. We know these few things, but there's still so much to learn about a species that's 
been there for how long and is on this planet with us for how long and we know very very little and how much more we have to learn um, about that species and others but just it's just a good thing to, to remind ourselves there's still so much to learn about planet earth that hopefully we will find out before we end up killing some of the stuff <laughs> from climate change and other impacts so hopefully we can we can balance those things out and learn more about these guys and keep them protected as well as our other species so um, so that will do it for this week. And uh, we hope you had a wonderful new year and that the start of 2022 is good and 2022 will be better than last year. <laughs> Hopefully I'm, I, there's a meme that came out that has a, it has 2020 as like a, as, as a big wave and then 2021 as a tidal wave and then 2022 is Godzilla. So I'm hoping that that is not going to be true. And I like like the meme that's got this referencing Taylor Swift that says, I'm feeling 22. I'm like, I like that one better. There we go. 22. I mean, you know, can't go wrong with that. I'll take that one. And my other one is that Betty White has like a lightsaber and she was, she's so epic that she went out the last minutes before 2022 came to take down 2021 so that 2022 will be better for us all. So thank you, Betty, for your, for your service. And hopefully 2022 will be awesome. Um, so we are excited. We should, the next episode, we will have an interview unless something crazy goes on. <laughs> um, and we'll be talking to our uh, friend and colleague um, that's doing ropeless fishing gear. Um, so we're excited to talk to him. Um, and that should be in the next episode, if not the next one after that, if anything crazy happens, but it shouldn't. And we're very excited for that. Uh, and so then also we do have a gift shop on our we have merch so please go to our website there's cute little stuffed animals we just had somebody buy a little humpback stuffed animal a young man and he was uh, very excited uh, about it and he loves it it's very cute um he goes with the the harbor seal stuffy that he bought before so he's creating uh, his own little ocean ocean realm at his house uh so check that out uh, follow us on uh, facebook and instagram and uh be sure to check out at the beginning of the month that the the poll for which marine mammal we will do next. We promise we will let you guys choose again. <laughs> uh, and so keep an eye on that. And I think uh, I think that does it. Mm -hmm. So we will yep. see you next time. Cool. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks. <laughs>